Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight in the show, we meet up once again with the globe-trottingest of single guys. And this time, we're following Xavier to New York City in the final film in Clappage's Spanish apartment trilogy, Chinese Puzzle. I can't stay here. I've met someone in New York. And I'm taking the children. I have to figure out how I can see my children. Hi. I just wanted to say I love your kids. You and I have a lot to say to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andy, this movie surprised me. Yeah, you said that. And I'm still trying to figure out how to interpret that. What, what way did it surprise you, Pete? Because I didn't like the second one. And I didn't hate the third one. <laughs> so so it's a, a glass is half full either way, but one's a little more <laughs> yeah. positive, positive, yeah. uh, 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 one, optimistic. One of those glasses has ice. Pessimistic. <laughs> Maybe a twist of lemon. <laughs>
Wow. Okay. It's okay. not. I'm not saying that I have a glowing uh, review of this film, and I think that it is tainted by uh, my impression of the characters that we inherited from Russian Dolls. But I have to tell you, I enjoyed this film much more. I feel like it was it was back to some of the stylistic kind of frivolousness of of the first, or I should say, frivolity of the first film of the Spanish Apartment, which I liked quite a bit. And and frankly, there were parts of it that actually reminded me so much of of Soderbergh and what I like so much of Steven Soderbergh's style and tone when he's, you know, the way he cuts film. Uh, I, I actually found I was more attracted to these characters in a lot of the movie. I still find myself puzzled with some behaviors that just strikes me off as off kilter in this movie. It is not a complete redemption of the Spanish Apartment trilogy, but it is uh, I, in, to my eye, a fairly dramatic improvement over what we got in the last film. What'd you think? Interesting. I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, I was equally disappointed with this one, and I'm just super, uh, super frustrated that this uh, trilogy started with a film that I really enjoy. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with that first film that, you know, uh, you know after conversations about some of the elements I certainly have a little more of a problem with now but on the whole I think I just really connected with the character as he was trying to figure out his uh, point in life and what he was going to do I think there was a really strong element there that I like quite a bit this film uh, it's it it didn't mire uh, Xavier in kind of some of the same awful behavior that he had in the second one, but it still put him in a place where he was just kind of lost and figuring himself out, but in ways that I wasn't as, as keen on and still left me a lot of questions about decisions that he made. Um, likewise, it took a character that I had kind of grown to really enjoy, Isabel, and it turned her into one of the worst characters in, in the trilogy. Yeah. And I was very upset and uh, frustrated. Yeah, the the role of being an ass in relationships is now Isabel's, and the entire orbit of infidelity is now Isabel's. And I hate that, especially because I like Jew. I like her girlfriend, and the, I like their relationship and their place in the world. And I felt like that, uh, you know, that that Isabel would fall in lust with the babysitter was such a dumb trope. And it is like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what redeems it. Right. Like it, on the surface, it feels like, oh, well, they're lesbians. And so the fact that she falls in love with the babysitter is actually subverting a norm because usually it's about the the middle aged man who is falling in love with the babysitter. And it's the Lolita thing. But we're doing something different because it's they're lesbians. That doesn't absolve it from being dumb and played out like it was not a good story. It was not a good story line at all for Isabel. I am one thousand percent with you on that point. Well, and the whole film felt I mean, we talked in the last conversation about Russian dolls, how this was really starting to feel like it was really obvious that there was a male gaze behind Klappich's, um mm -hmm. uh, construction of his stories this film felt the most that way the fact the the way that he employed lesbians in the film was frankly kind of offensive throughout like the relationship that isabel has with the babysitter i mean i get it there's attraction like that it happens but do they need to be running across the rooftops naked like it just it you know just felt like he was putting that in because he's just like well i want to get these ladies running around naked out there so let's let's just write this that way and then there's the whole scene where he's at the sperm bank yeah. and he's trying to figure out you know he can't uh you know get going to get his donation going so he's looking at a uh, french playboy and fantasizes this lesbian scene with all these uh, women as they kind of come to life in the magazine it just it all just felt like you know i just I really was kind of disappointed i felt like there was a lot more to what clappich was doing in the first film and he just I don't know. I feel like his films, as I look at them as a whole now, have really become mired in just infidelity and uh, kind of this this way that he looks at these uh, relationships. It's just it just feels a lot trashier now. Yeah, I, I guess I can see that. I, I wonder how much of that. And I this is a question I can't 
I can't answer reliably because I may be speaking firmly in the corner of stereotype. But is there uh, anything to the idea that maybe this film as a French film, as an international production, but a predominantly French film, has a different eye toward infidelity than, you know, than we do? And and leaning so heavily in on infidelity as we follow, you know, this 10-year journey of Xavier is um, is something that is... Um, you know, maybe not as let's say acceptable, but certainly more of a uh, of an accepted norm in cinema. I, I don't know if that's true. Would that would would it make it any easier I, if we were French? <laughs> well, it's funny that you say that. I actually was talking to my uh, my friend who actually. Uh, is the one who told me that this was a trilogy. I had only seen the first film, and he said, oh, you know, it's a whole trilogy. You should watch the other ones. And I talked to him after Russian Dolls, and I'm like, man, what a departure from the first film. And he's like, well, you know, I talked to my buddy who I knew while I was living over in France, and he said that it was a film that, as a Parisian man, uh, he felt very connected to because it really kind of felt like you know there were a lot of elements of that character that he recognized so i think that your point is valid to a certain extent i think there is a cultural thing there but at the same time if that is a cultural thing it still is a trashy cultural thing and french people need to wake up and get over this fact that infidelity (laughs) is just you know a a french whim (laughs) andy (laughs) i'm working i'm working on a new country every time I get on the show. Who Seriously, can I this, yeah. Who's this next? Day? Who is next? Uruguay. Well, I figured. Get I in figured line. Ireland, <laughs> Ireland, and uh, Australia have to suffer my accent mm-hmm. on all of our Saturday matinees. They so. do. So it's about time. You. <laughs> it's about time to hit the French. Uh-huh. <laughs> hit the French where it hurts in the <laughs> infidelity. Yeah, is that who you said was next? Uruguay. Yeah. No, they're getting in line. I don't know why. <laughs> I I feel like that's that is certainly an issue. Back to the point, I think that's cer- there is certainly a, an issue of cultural perspective that uh, that is at work here. I found more of a connection personally with Xavier in this film now that he is not an overt jerk to women. Uh, I still struggled with rooting their. Uh, like his relationship angle in the breakup of him and Wendy. I didn't like it. I didn't like her motivation. I didn't like I didn't like the the sort of uh, the ease with which she met someone and decided to get a new apartment and move on. I, I didn't like all of that. That mechanic felt, you know, in many ways, as much of a dirty trick as what they did with Isabel and and infidelity in her relationship. Uh, it left a really poor taste in my mouth. But it gave us the opportunity to get him to New York in a way that allowed for a sense of exploration of the city. And that is an area of this film that I had a really good time with. The Chinatown part, the cab part, the 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 exploration on the train. I, I felt like there was a uh, there was a nice sense of natural wonder to how he lived in the city, how he was working the bike messenger bit, how he was, I mean, all of that stuff. I actually felt like I walked away with a sense of of kind of, dare I say it, a little bit of joy uh, watching how he lived in New York City. And uh, it made me miss New York City. And I, I think there's some, there has to be something that the film earns back for that. I, I agree. I mean, I think that is a really nicely done part of the story, that exploration of this new world as he's finding himself, as he's navigating kind of the the seedy ways to survive in a city he is not allowed to legally be in. You know, there were a lot of things that I I shouldn't say legally work in is really what I should say. It, it I, I think that it really kind of painted an interesting picture, and I did like some of those elements. And I, I mean, I'm being harsh on the film, but that's because there are like the, the key story elements are the ones that I have serious problems with. And when you have issues with the key story, that's the film. Mm-hmm. I like this world that he's in. I think it's great. I like some of the people that he meets, especially the ones that he's meeting at like Dad's Day Out at the park. Um, great and bits. I, I think, great bits. Yeah, we are I think warriors. There are some really nice bits. It's great. And and the kids. I think he's got great kids. He's got a, a nice relationship with the kids. I think there are a lot of strong elements in the film. The problem is the core foundation of it is this story that is just really frustrating. I am very upset going back to your point earlier about his breakup with Wendy that I get it. You know, you have 
uh, very dear and close friends to you who are, it's a lesbian couple and they really want a kid. They ask if you will be the donor for the sperm so that they can have a baby. And then he does it even though his wife doesn't want him to. That is, uh, I mean, I, I totally get why Wendy would divorce him. That's like, that's a very kind of devious and, and uh, you know. Immature. It's a thing it's that you shouldn't do. Is what it is. Yeah, it's it's immature. It's not. Uh, it's just not appropriate. You know. It's. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like that's you've when you're <laughs> when you're married to somebody. That is one of those things you need to get approved before you move forward and do. You know. You just don't go do it. Anymore. Well, she said no, but eh, you know what? It's okay because I really want you to be okay, Isabel. It's like who are you married to, dude? Yeah. So. You know, I totally get why she, she divorced him. I, I was very frustrated with him. And it was an immature move. And, and I don't know what the laws are for moving out of country when you have kids. I know in the U.S. there's a little more work that is involved if you're leaving the country um, with kids when you're in a marriage. I don't know how it is in other countries. So I don't know if it was inappropriately easy for Wendy to move to the U.S. or if that is something that's easy when you're living in France. Um, but that's something my, that really bugged my wife. I, I want to go back to this issue of, of immaturity because it's a thing that uh, it, it is the overriding, I think, uh, element in this film that frustrates me as much as I love the, the things that he did stylistically that Klappich did stylistically to the film um, that I think in some part obscure my impression of the characters that I have come not to like uh, the, the level of immaturity displayed in a film that is purported to tell us what life is like for these people who are now supposedly adults um, is I think really frustrating. Um, you know, as we've already talked about the central theme of infidelity in uh, Isabel's life, that she has grown up not at all, even though I think arguably she did demonstrate that as a character she had been growing up in the last relationship, right? In the last film, in Russian Dolls, she was a more mature person than she is in this one. In this film... Oh, yeah, she's horrible in this film. Yeah, she's she takes on the role of being just horrible. But the entire sort of uh, comical, heisty climax of the film is, once again, an effort of, of uh, you know, a great uh, sort of logistical uh, cell phone calls running through the city prowess to actually save Isabel from being discovered as a philanderer. Right. And yeah. her girlfriend is coming over. They're going to show that it's a it's a big it is the same thing that happened in the first film. It is the same, same exact thing, except for this time we're not protecting Wendy when her boyfriend's coming to see her having an affair. We're protecting Isabel. And it, it puts this idea of friendship the the sort of the the strong ties the deep ties of personal friendship over the deep ties of romantic you know r relationships honest and and relationships of integrity and i found that really frustrating i found it so frustrating that we were a seeing the story played out again but the the only thing that allowed me to forgive it was that these were a bunch of kids in the first movie, effectively, right? They were twenty young 20-somethings, and they were trying to figure out their way in the world. And now, uh, by all rights, by what is what they're selling me on the tin is that these people are 10 years older now, right? They have kids at stake. They have careers at stake. Why are they behaving like this? I did not— right get it the entire that that made the entire sort of third act of the film just kind of melt away i was very frustrated by that not only that but it's it's used clearly because he's trying to just have fun with it and recreate that sense of the spanish apartment but at the expense of all the other story beats right because it just turns into this thing to kind of save isabel but also to kind of create this faux, uh, you know, faux 
relationship that he has with this Chinese woman that he's kind of set up with for the immigration people. Right. right. And then that's dropped. Like that whole storyline is never brought up again. Like did, I mean, did those immigration people buy into all of this? It was like, you know, nonsense. If I was that guy, I would have like been, you're clearly faking this whole thing. Like they were so bad at he, it. He tele- like, that's is- exactly what he telegraphed the immigration agent was that yeah. there's there's no way you expect me to actually believe this, right? Uh, but that that never gets resolved. But here's an interesting point on that, Andy. I got me thinking again with that international perspective. Um, you know, I, there was this moment in the film that I like a lot where there's this argument about how you know how can you hire this guy right off the street? He's a foreigner, and the the guy says we're all foreigners, you idiot. You know, I go get go to work. Um, so he hires Xavier illegally, but it is so glossed over. And initially I thought, well, that's a really interesting part of the story to just leave be like, it's something we're not going to be concerned about. But then we get the last line where we discover that, you know, he actually has a spark for Martine and he's chasing her down the street and he gets her off the bus and she says, I have to have a job. What am I going to do? And he says, you remember what he says? Oh, yes. Don't worry. We'll find you an American. Yeah. Insinuating, don't worry, we're going to find you a, a man to marry so that you can stay here. And so that makes a, gives me a new sense of the film, of what they're trying to say about what it means to move here and how cavalier he is about skirting the rules that have been put into place and the laws that have put in into place around immigration uh, and making them almost incidental to this idea of you know flirtation and and romance and 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 all of that and i thought that actually was maybe the most unintentionally interesting element of the film well it is and especially now with the way immigration has become yes. such a um a hot button Right. It's, yeah. I mean, it, it, you just want to get, you want to find out if, you know, whose side you're on quickly, just bring up immigration and you could yeah, right. you know, get a sense of, of your position. Well, with especially people. where you live. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm right on the border. I mean, I'm not on the border. I'm in Phoenix, but still, you know, we're a border you're state. Border and enough. So we certainly yeah. see, yeah, we certainly see quite a bit of, of things that are going on down here. And absolutely, you know, this whole kind of cavalier attitude of, oh, yeah, we'll find you an American. And even though it's a Frenchman saying it to a French woman, it still <laughs> speaks to perspective. For, and it, you're right. It is a really interesting point that the film does bring up about how people from outside the country view immigration and view opportunity within this country and view kind of the system and how they can game it to find this, you know, kind of, quote, better life. It is it is kind of an interesting uh, point that is brought up here. Um, but to that end, it's still, it, it, it's, it, it doesn't solve the story issue and make it any better. All right. <laughs> there, there's this other angle that we haven't talked about yet because so much of the movie is about um, you know his relationship with women, and that's his relationship with his father, uh, which I, you know, I, I found it was interesting that his father is even, you know, granted entrance into this film, and it's brief. It's a walk around town uh, that ends in, I, I think, a, a nice sort of weirdly uh, sensitive, and then hammer over the head, not insensitive moment, uh, where you know he's he's you know Xavier comes clean and says, "This is what I did. I'm actually a father to this child. I was doing it as a gen- an act of great generosity." And the father's response is so predictable uh, that it, you you almost have to slap yourself, thinking, "Could I really have expected that from this guy?" But of course you did. He says you know uh you should not get involved you should absolutely stay away and you kind of want that to be an example of the father having learned a lesson over the years but of course he hasn't learned a lesson at all uh so that's all that's all fine and then later xavier's walking home and he finds this symbol this heart with the father's and the mother's initials and that symbol is now supposed to weigh on us as an audience right it's supposed to be a thing that matters because it matters to xavier as a relationship as a, a, a like an artifact of the love that his mother and father once had for one another 
How did that hit you? Did that hit you as hard as it felt like Clappich wanted it to hit? No, I mean, it's it's a it's a point that's in there, I guess, but I, I I don't know. I wasn't really sure what direction he was trying to go with that because it's not like his parents had a successful relationship. So I wasn't sure, you know, really what he was trying to say by having that moment. Like you're, you know, you can have an amazing moment of love that can mark time and, you know, it, it can always live on in one capacity or another, but it's like is it always going to be there? I, I don't know. I, I I don't know what you think he was trying to say with that. Well, I mean, I, I feel like he was he was talking about his like, how do we take the lessons of our of our fathers and turn them into lessons that we can integrate into our own lives? And then in, in this case, pass on to his kids, Tom and Mia, who are lovely children and lovely little actors there. I thought they were really fun to watch. Um, and, and so I. I enjoy that part of it. I enjoy the fact that it feels like he's going to learn something here. And then he proceeds not to learn anything by, you know, demonstrating that infidelity is a thing to protect and uh, like, right. you know, leaving the baby with the 13 year old oh, in the park, yeah. which I have to say became a massive distraction for me. <laughs> I, I I thought like as soon as you play with the baby, it's like the gun on the mantelpiece you know, on the mantel place, right? You know, like it. This is the only thing I can think about is you just left a baby with a thirteen year old and some younger kids to watch over them in a park, and you forgot them there because you had to go protect your friend from being discovered that she was a flanderer. I was totally distracted by that through what I think was probably the next ten minutes of the film. That's all I could think about. That's not a, a sign well, and, of great narrative uh, structure building. And that certainly could also be a cultural thing. I mean, I think America has become very much, um, you know, a whole bunch of helicopter, um, you know, parenting people flying around and situations like that. Just, you know, I mean, I, it freaks me out, too. Yeah, well, that. and I, I certainly like, no, wouldn't do doing? it. Yeah. What are you doing? Why would you do that? What are you doing? Yeah, right. You Why know? would you do that? Why would you do that? Well, and it's not it, it's honestly it's not because of. um it's not because of, like, I have a grand anxiety about, you know, kids going missing, but that's honestly not what I was thinking about. I was thinking about these kids are throwing their bodies around on playground structures and nobody's paying attention to mine because I'm leaving, yeah. right? You know, like, yeah, right. they could just straight up get hurt and you kind of want to be present with that. But Yeah, I've seen Kramer versus Kramer. <laughs> he, he had to run to the hospital. He ran kid. like hell, Andy. <laughs> so uh, so that, that I found really frustrating and um and and not it didn't demonstrate what i think the lesson could have been from such a sweet moment that he experienced with the the memory of his father and i actually liked the dichotomy there that the memory of his father was more important to him than the actual experience with his father which was a train wreck well and that's the point that i think I I would have liked to be stronger because he has such weird relationships with his parents. I mean, we've certainly seen that with his mom because he's always been terrible to her, yeah. even though like, you know, we see in the second film, she's they're divorced and she's now got a new bow. And then here, you know, we get this brief bit with the father that, yeah, he kind of he leaves him on the island in the middle, <laughs> middle of the yes. road. It was a very odd um, relationship uh, and conversation that I thought was pretty interesting. And I think it spoke a lot to just his relationships with his parents and that, uh, I, and maybe that was part of the point is that his parents weren't really there or weren't that great at raising him. And so his relationships with them are tenuous at best, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean there aren't those key points that do affect you and who you grow into. I just wish that it felt stronger for me by the time I came out the other side of this film. Okay, Andy, then how about John? Wendy uh, goes and moves to New York, and the man that she meets is John, who is a towering eight and a half feet tall. And uh, he has to duck to uh, walk in and out of New York apartments, and he eats eggs with a, a giant uh, serving spoon. 
He's a giant of a man, John. And he also wears... You make him sound like Hulk. He also wears <laughs> giant versions of Xavier's clothes. And he lives in a really swanky place. Oh, it's so swanky. Park. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's very swanky. And yeah. there is another nice tour of New York uh, when Xavier has to find his way to that apartment. And he explains to Isabel and Jew, uh, wait, I just have to get over here. Is that like far? Can I walk it? And it's it's like multiple trains and it, it's a, a, a mess to get into where he needs to get to see this. So there are so many sort of logical and physical barriers to getting him over to that apartment that when the first thing that we see is that John opens the door and Xavier is confronted by uh, this massive guy wearing just a cleaner version of his shirt. Uh, I, I think it sends a really interesting message. Um, and they have this scene that is enormously awkward. And I wonder, did that hit you at all uh, in the soft place? Soft place. Well, and this, so there are elements that Klappich does really well, and those are the elements that you talked about, like the fun tours of the city and all of that, like with the subway maps and later when he's trying to find an apartment and it turns into like cutouts and Google Maps and all sorts of stuff. I mean, there were some really fun, Super clever fun. things. He is, he is a very assured filmmaker and the way that he builds his story it's very exciting and they're super easy watches. I mean, that's something that I really do enjoy about these as frustrating as I have grown with the story. I think that they're just, just really masterfully done films. I, I do agree. I think actually this is a relationship that I did like, I liked the relationship between, um, between Xavier and this person that has kind of replaced him. I thought it was an interesting element to, to add in and i think that they did it in a way that was really nice he wasn't some sleazy guy that you really hated he wasn't like the worst person in the world he was just kind of a guy and totally normal and nothing wrong with him and that's i think largely how it usually is and and i i I liked that it came across that way well and and i actually really liked that both isabel and wendy were sort of giving the opposite advice or or i should say john when he was giving advice he was they they were looking at you know please look at their uh, look at their point of view john was such a he was just a great ear uh, as, as soon as as Xavier left, and I think he was like he was written as a, a guy who was so understanding, almost to the point where you, you know it's it it gets back to the male gaze. Like these male characters were so great that you kind of feel like, wow, all, all right, are we are we really letting Xavier <laughs> off maybe a little bit easily? Uh, but but still, yeah. it, it was it was easy to find a, a connection with them. Um, and between them, and I think he was, uh, I think he was a good thing in the movie. I think we do need to talk about the the title and kind of the Chinese element within the story. Yeah, uh, specifically the fact that uh, not just that he ends up living in Chinatown thanks to Ju, Isabel's uh, girlfriend, but the fact that he ends up kind of connecting to the U.S. through this faux relationship he creates with this Chinese woman who he meets through this really strangely coincidental situation where he's riding in a taxi. The driver gets lost, gets out and yells at a guy because his truck is blocking the road. This truck driver gets out, starts beating the car and beating the driver. And then Xavier (laughs) puts the driver in the seat and takes him to the hospital. And his family just like you know, they think the world of Xavier now and want to help him. And so the way they do that is by, you know, he's like, well, I just need a wife, <laughs> you know, a <laughs> weird thing to say. And they're like, oh, well, hey, here's my sister. And <laughs> they kind of hook him up. It's an, it's an, I don't know. I was a little disappointed, uh, to be honest, that we didn't end up in China at some point. Russian dolls took us to Russia. Uh, Spanish apartment took us to Spain. Um but, you know, Chinatown wasn't bad, and I actually kind of liked this this side of New York that we don't often see. I know that uh, Klappich had kind of a connection with New York because of having gone to school there. Um, and so I kind of, uh, 
I don't know. I, I kind of enjoyed this part of the story. What did you think of it? Well, I liked it um, because I like this part of New York and I like the color and the vibrance and the fish and the like everything, all the screaming and yelling at one another. And I just think it's a it, it's, you know, it, it challenges my natural introversion in a way that I find is kind of satisfying. You know, uh, I also found that the exchange um it was one of those kind of romantic comedy exchanges, right? The weirdest sort of hospital bed meet cute that wasn't, you know? I mean, when he said, I, I couldn't really <laughs> read if it was that um, uh, Doris was delivering this role or this line in a way that was supposed to be sort of sarcastic, you know? Well, if you could find me a wife by tomorrow, that'd be great. Like, it, it didn't come off sarcastic. It same, came off very authentic, which made the exchange very authentic between the uncle, which made it sort of a, it, it made it much more of a, uh, I don't know, like a commercial exchange that I found kind of gross. Now, on the other <laughs> yeah. side of this, uh, the actress who plays uh, the the role of the sister cousin, I can't, I couldn't figure out the relationship, the niece of, I guess, you know, the uncle, yeah. uh, Lee Jun Lee, I, I like her a lot. And I found myself from the moment they started taking pictures together, I wanted this to be one of those green card stories where actually she was the one that we got to see more of, and it just never played out. And that was one of the weird, like, forked narratives that I wish I was watching through the rest of the movie after that. I thought, well, that's a that's going to be a clever little setup, and it's gonna we're going to be able to ride this home to the end of the film. It's going to be great. And it never it never paid off. I couldn't agree more. I really enjoyed that kind of faux relationship that they had created, and I wanted to see it blossom into something. I And I feel like they could have. Like, uh, I don't know how I feel about his return to Martine, and if that just feels like the expected thing because it's Audrey Tattoo, and and from the beginning, people were probably telling Clappich, it's like, how could he not end up with her? She's she's the perfect woman. I don't know, but that's that's how I felt mm -hmm. watching it. It's like in the first film, he's just like, and that is the last time I will ever give her a kiss or whatever. Because as as he says goodbye to her, it's like clearly these two are not meant to be together. Right. And then all of a sudden, it's like, no, clearly we're meant to be together. It's like what. What is going on? I mean, I understand life can throw these curveballs at you sometimes, but I don't know. It just never felt like the story we were meant to be told. That's right. That's right. From every one of these sort of relationship twists was unearned and a surprise and never resolved in a way that was satisfying. Even though fi the the one thing I can say about this movie is that the Audrey Tutu marketing finally pays off. Like she's <laughs> she really is in this movie and she is as charming as I want her to be. And uh, even though I'm not crazy about the character, I have to tell you, I get a war feeling seeing the 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 sequence of these three women sitting on the bench together in the subway um i i like them i, I have positive memories of elements of all of them and i i kind of like that moment when uh when martine's i think it's martine who says you know the answer is you need uh all you need one woman that is actually made up of all three of us uh and in a better movie, that line would have really meant something. I think that's the the central issue with the film is I feel like it's a it's a story that's designed to have these moments that kind of reflect this character and his kind of transition through life as he kind of finds himself and and finds his kind of his center, I guess. But I feel like those moments are designed to be there in a way that makes it feel very designed. It doesn't feel natural at all. And that's kind of been the way that this uh, we've been moving more and more as we've gone through this trilogy. Yep. I actually did really like the way that the film ended. I thought that was not not the final ending. Like the, we have some credits and then we come back to this nonsensical thing of just everybody marching happily through the streets of New York. Like what kind of bozo thing is that it's it was so dumb to see all these people together especially i mean you might as well have had the immigration guy hand in hand with with xavier as they walk through the street i just I, that was <laughs> unnecessary for me 
Um, but what I did like was this final moment where you have this guy that we have this conversation with Xavier and his editor because his editor doesn't like the way that his book is. And Xavier says, I know your spiel about tragedy. It's true. Most stories do feed on misery. But when you find happiness, there's nothing more to say. So you should just stop. And then the editor says, are you talking about in life or in the novel? Yeah. And he and Martine just smile. They've stopped. And I was like, that was actually really smart. That is a great example of strong writing yep. and a strong finish for this film. I just wish that the rest of it felt like it got me there. But I yep. did like what he was saying, this idea about, you know, this this thing about life. It's just like life. And I, I think that this is something I actually do like about this film and this trilogy, even if I find it frustrating, is that life is a wacky thing and it never makes that much sense. And when you do find happiness, you latch onto it and you just hang on as long as you can. And I think that this this trilogy does highlight that pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that it does. I really did like the conversations with the editor. Sometimes I didn't like what they were saying, you know, what it, the message he was trying to send. But I did like that we kept popping back to this familiar face on Skype and that that sort of drove the the chapter markers in the in the film you know it was it, it was a nice way to sort of yeah. break up the narrative and i think as a tool it worked really well and it was a way to continue to demonstrate that you know the work of the writer is a slog and it's we're at a point in his career that it's it's hard and uncomfortable and he's doing things that are new and he's doing things that are new to him in times that he is emotionally compromised I'm thinking about the his first sort of speech that that we get to see him make where he is very upset and you know he's about to open his mouth but he can't he just he's about to start crying too and and I thought that was a that was a great little performative element in the in the film that um at the um book yeah thing yeah yeah. yeah, I really liked that those little moments. I, I really did. I mean, those those were were bits that were highlights to me. And I found myself, again, wishing for that movie. Like, let's talk more about his career and, and what it means to be a writer and what he's learning and, and, and conveying through his work uh, about his life and these relationships. I found there was such a general disconnect between what he was doing in his in his work this that's supposed to be this autobiographical, you know, piece that's talking about his relationships, it, it was not a substantive connection between what we were seeing on screen. Uh, at no point right, does he right. deal with the, you know, the the infidelity part, right, with that he's witnessing and that he is supporting. Uh, at no point does he deal with the parenting stuff. At no point, I mean, it's all, it's, it's all this really sort of, uh, it, it comes so strongly from the ego. Every little piece we get in his writing comes from the ego, and I found that fatiguing. I just also have to point out, going back to the infidelity, it's not just that Isabel is having an affair. It's that he's letting her use his apartment, yeah. which he's renting from Jew, Isabel's partner. And it's like, it's, it's, it flabberga it's flabbergasting that he would do that because if Isabel does get caught, as they almost do, it's likely that Jew would kick him out. And we know how hard it was for him to find a place in the first place. Yeah. Self-destructive. Yeah, very bad. Very bad, Andy. Mm -hmm. How to do uh, an award season? Did you get any any notice? The 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 franchise has dropped quite a bit as it's progressed. It wasn't very big. The um the only two nominations that it did get were at the at the Caesar Awards in 2014. It did get nominated for best original music for uh, I don't know how you say this, Lois Dury and Christoph Mink, but they did not walk away with the prize. They uh, ended up going to uh, Age of Uprising, The Legend of Michael. Kohlhaas, which I haven't heard of, but uh, that's the thing that walked away with Best Original Music. And then over at the San Francisco International Film Festival, it was nominated for Best Narrative Feature uh, for an Audience Award, but it did not win that uh, either. It, that went to uh, Dear White People. That was nominated, or that one is the hmm. Best Narrative Feature. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. How about the budget? How to do it at the box office? 
Well, for this final entry in his trilogy, Cedric Klapich did get uh, a production budget of 23.46 million dollars, which is about 24 million in today's dollars. Uh, you know, I think you know his his budgets really kind of increased each time. I mean, La Berge Espagnole in today's dollars, it was a 7.9 million dollar budget. And for Russian dolls, uh, it was thirteen point one million dollars. So, you know, it was a, you know definitely a good jump up for him to go to uh, twenty four point one million. I mean, he, he's really increased the budget. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what changed to make this one feel like it needed another ten or eleven million dollars. Just the location was it New York locations? Because it feels very much like the other yeah. two. You know, nothing about this film felt like a more expensive film. I don't, did you feel it was? It felt that way. Not at all. It but it was interesting. Way. I ran into this article that, um, or the interview with Klapich, and he said exactly what you just said. That in fact, it was really hard. I always wanted to shoot there in New York, in Chinatown, but it was really hard because New York City is an incredibly expensive place, and we were a modest budget film in a very expensive place with much more expensive expectations of of crews. And so it was yeah. a real challenge logistically and financially to make this film work, but he felt very strongly to, uh, about doing it. He lived there for a year while he was writing the script. He shot when, you know, after they lost power, like the, the he, he's got some more stories. Uh, about this film interesting but that well, drove yeah, up the budget yeah. i bet that did i mean an extra 10 million i mean that's a hefty chunk yeah. for a film that feels very much the, the same as the other it ones. feels gorilla and um, indie in many places it's not yeah. yeah right right chinese puzzle was released over in europe october 16th 2013 and then it had its u.s release may 16th 2014 where it opened opposite uh godzilla and million dollar arm um, this film obviously did not take the weekend as uh, it was a much smaller, much more limited release. It was head release. to head with Godzilla. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it actually, it did expand eventually. It only opened in two theaters that weekend, slowly expanding to a maximum of 29 theaters here in the States. It did not, uh, it did not make a lot of money here in the U S the film only ended up making, Three hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars here in the states, and did a little better overseas. Seven point one million. That gives it an adjusted total gross of seven point seven million. But on the budget that it had, it ended up losing a very big chunk of change, um, and that put it at an adjusted loss per finished minute of one hundred forty point six thousand dollars. So this very much is, uh, you know, kind of the last film of this trilogy, and I. I think based on what he did here i don't think clappage is going to get any more money to make uh, a continuation of the story of xavier and his um uh, unfaithful exploits yeah um that, that was in the interview with uh Roman Duris, uh, he was asked you know what do you think about coming back and playing this character again and you know, he said rather auspiciously, he says, who knows where these characters are going to go, right? Um, maybe we just need to wait another 10 years. And I think that's an that's an easy and for those of us who aren't huge fans of the film, probably a hopeful out. I think there's a reason that that uh, trilogies like this that are more of a relationship trilogy explored over time. Uh, there's a reason that something like the Before Trilogy is going to stand out as something that people want to revisit over time because those characters feel very authentic and decisions get made that actually lead to consequences. And they feel like, you know, this is something that really is going to cause uh, issues in uh, in our lives. And if I felt like some of these unfaithful moments between these characters would actually lead to things like that, I feel like this could have been Clappage's own before trilogy and could have been something that actually explored these characters. Because there's nothing wrong inherently with having a story about characters who are unfaithful and who do the things that these characters do. But when it's done just for fun and you don't end up kind of having consequences for any actions, it becomes, it, it, I mean, it really ends up being no different than a lot of kind of like the 80s uh, teen sex comedies. It's like that's not how you tell a story. You have to give us characters that 
Uh, yes, they can be sloppy and make mistakes and do nonsensical things sometimes, but there still need to be consequences to those actions. And I just don't feel like we're rooted in that world here. Well, given that, this should be a real treat. <laughs> Andy, I think it's time for you and I to rank it. Oh, let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel, and uh, you'll see all the movies that we've talked about on this show. If you swipe over in your show notes and you tap this film, the title of this film, uh, Chinese Puzzle, that will take you exactly to Chinese Puzzle at Flickchart, where you can add it to your list and see how it stacks up against ours. All right. First up, we have Chinese Puzzle or Rocky Three. Taking Rocky Three, please. Okay. Rocky Three. Chinese Puzzle or A Star is Born, 1976. <laughs> Arm Streisand and Chris Christopherson. Oof. Wow. Okay. Was there a Ferrari in Chinese Puzzle? No Ferrari. I'm, I'm going to be Chinese Puzzle on this one. Yeah, I am too. Uh, the story is frustrating in both cases for me. Um, Chinese Puzzle is a very easy watch, so yeah. it's going to win on that account. Chinese Puzzle or King's Row? I'm going to take King's Row. Yeah. Where's King's, the rest of me? King's Row. That's right. <laughs> Chinese Puzzle or Lupin the Third, the castle of Cagliostro. I'll take I'll, Lupin. I'll take Lupin. Chinese Puzzle or Red Belt? Red Belt. <laughs> that was our first great travesty of flick chart. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> you know, I would put Red Belt on first. Yeah, you would. Uh, I'm surprised by that, but Chinese puzzle or the Sandlot? Absolutely, the Sandlot. Sandlot. Chinese puzzle or the Adventures of Baron Munchausen? Definitely Munchausen. Munchausen. Chinese puzzle or Christmas in July? Christmas in July. Christmas for me. in July, please. Chinese puzzle or La Femme Nikita? La Femme Nikita. I will take Nikita as well. Well, that puts Chinese puzzle at three o one. Three o one out of four o one. Wow. But yeah, it's down at twenty five percent. Well, how did how did it do in your personal list? I'm as I'm bringing mine up. Uh, I'm curious. Weirdly, almost the same. It landed really? at three three thousand sixty eight out of four thousand one hundred twenty six, and it's a twenty six percent on my chart. Well, I told you I had more uh, to like about it, and I, apparently, I I must have watched a lot more bad movies on my flick chart list because this ended up <laughs> at 637 out of 1081 uh and that puts it at 41 percent uh if i'm to go by the algorithm you know what that means over at letterbox.com slash the next reel this should be a two-star film uh i that's what i gave for russian dolls was two stars i believe and yep uh so i i like this more than that but i don't like this as much as uh, the four and a half star rating that we gave the Spanish apartment. I th I think I'm going to be okay with this as a three star film. Is that three stars and a like or no? No, no, just three stars. It's it's a three stars and a fine. For me, uh, this ended up on par with Russian Dolls. Uh, the algorithm says I should give it a 1.5. I think that may be a little too low because, like I said, he's an assured filmmaker. I enjoy watching his films, even if I get frustrated by them. This is a breezy film to watch. It still has a lot of fun. It has a lot of elements in it that I, I thought were enjoyable. So I'm going to give it two stars, and I'm not giving it a heart. So that, that averages out to a two and a half. Uh, I, I think this one I celebrated much more, or I feel like it, it clever washed, uh, you know, so many of the characters traits that I'm, I'm not a fan of with, uh, you know, visual cleverness and fun camera stuff and, and, uh, on screen shiny things that, uh, that I think are, are a treat to watch. So it's okay. It's okay. It's, you know, I, I, I do think. I do think that there's an element of kind of cultural reading that you do have to take yeah. into account with this one. And I, I mean, that may be the case. I, I, it's, it doesn't change my feelings on the film. I think Clappage is a really interesting filmmaker. I'm curious about watching more of his films because I, I find these just such beautifully fun films to watch. It's just very frustrating the way that these, they ended up going. So that's, that's where I landed. Uh, all right. So what does that mean? We've got another mega series coming up. We do. Uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. I think uh, we've both been looking forward to this for some time now. We're going to be jumping into the films of Ingrid Bergman. 
and I am very much excited to kind of explore her career a little bit. We are doing it over an eight film series that was all picked by our um, our Patreon supporters and the people who are part of our Discord group. We had the whole list of uh, Bergman's films that we were uh, we thought we'd kind of talk about in there, and everybody voted, and we landed on these eight, starting with Casablanca, 1942. And wow. ending with Autumn Sonata in 1978. So we've got a great swath of films covering her uh, her career for uh, you know 35-ish years. And I'm very much looking forward to jumping in because I think she's a great actress. And I, I think I've seen uh, all but two of the films we're going to be looking at. So it's going to be a fun one. Well, I am... So, so glad that we're doing this series. There are a couple of films on here that I, uh, I'm quite fond of. And finally, as many times as I bring up the Casablanca relationship uh, on this show when talking yeah, right. about films, it's about damn time that we actually talk about Casablanca. Uh, I, I can't wait. That and Gaslight. Oh. Big fan. Yeah, yeah, I know. Especially because I believe that at some point, if not several points, you have mentioned that Casablanca was the number one spot on your flick chart. So I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, well, it's not, I Andy, we'll and that's find out. probably your fault. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, anyhow, it is. It has uh, lived in that uh, top spot for a long time. So I'm I'm excited to re rank it and see see what comes of it. Well, everybody, if you want to hear more of us, but you can't wait until next week's show. Check out our other show, The Marvel Movie Minute. We're talking about the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. We've started with 2008's Iron Man. You can support that show and all of our shows over on thenextreel.com slash Patreon. And you can get access to our weekend show, The Saturday Matinee. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andrew. As Amazon always doeth. If we go mining deep enough, there are some gems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we've got two that point out some uh, some r- real critical missteps in the film. That uh, I think. What, what would you would you like to go first, or you want me to go? For what are you feeling? How, how do you think we could build a case using Amazon this week? I think that uh, I should start because I think okay. yours has the has the finish that we need. Okay, good. I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, mine is by Matthew Lemon, who uh, gives it two stars, says it's mostly 90% in French, despite what the trailer shows. Also, mostly mediocre in content. Oh, well, at least it isn't Transformers. <laughs> it's mostly in French, mostly mediocre, not Transformers. Outstanding I like learning opportunity. The- I like that that he apparently did a calculation to figure out it's actually 90%. 90%, that's right. Yeah. But he doesn't do that for the mediocre percentage. No. I'd like to have seen <laughs> I'd like to have seen the percentage for mediocrity. How mediocre and how many decimal places <laughs> do we need to take this? Exactly. Uh, Geltner steps up and says that it's nowhere near as good as the first film. Sadly, nowhere near as good as the first film Auberge Espagnole. If you haven't seen that one, it's wonderful. This film mostly takes place in New York City. Romain Duris has long, lanky, greasy-looking hair, which is a poor image for a leading man. I did watch the entire film, but was not pleased. Mm. So the lanky, greasy hair is a real standout performer. I I guess that's the thing that really uh, affected him. Very negatively, clearly. Yeah. No, I and I think that's an important thing to take. And and if there is a, a better excuse for you and I to continue our styles uh, of, of <laughs> hair, I don't know, I don't know what it is. So oh. thanks, Gelt. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Amazon. <laughs>
It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great movies, so many great conversations. But it's a lot of work. Producing this show week after week does require a lot behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We had some great films in Season 8 that started their lives as books or plays, and you can find all of them on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can find links to purchase all the source material behind the adapted films we've covered from season one up through our current season. For part of season eight, we had a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of films from 1968. We talked about 2001 and 2010 for our Odyssey series, both adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novels. Man, the second one was so much better than the first, right? Don't you even get me started. (sighs) Need I bring up Under the Cherry Moon again? Yes, also so much better. (laughs) Wait, wait, no, that's not what I... (sighs) Planet of the Apes kicked off its series based on the novel by Pierre Boulet. We covered Danger Diabolic and The Detective, adapted from novels for our 1968 crime films. Wait, wasn't that The Detective the prequel to Die Hard? They were both written by Roderick Thorpe, and yes, it's the same character in the books. I can't believe they even asked Sinatra if he'd be in Die Hard. That would have been weird. (laughs) Uh, Once Upon a Time in America was part of our Leone Once Upon a Time trilogy, adapted from Harry Gray's novel. And we looked at 1968 Best Picture nominees The Lion in Winter, Rachel Rachel, Romeo and Juliet, and Oliver! We also had an Ingrid Bergman series with adaptations like Spellbound, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Murder on the Orient Express, and Gaslight. We haven't talked about Gaslight. Stop gaslighting me! (laughs) Dive deeper into these books and more adapted films at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations that we've covered on all the Next Reel family of podcasts and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. 